So today we've got a fabulous case study for you of a tennis player who presents with shoulder pain. The key focus for this case study, can you find out the diagnosis? If you're ready to find out, let's dive in. So everyone, let's dive into this case study. So we have a 52 year old lady who's presenting with sharp, severe left sided shoulder pain, which she feels is getting worse. She is left handed, which is making these symptoms even more irritable. Now she reports that her symptoms came on approximately one month ago, and we know that she's a keen tennis player. And so she is using her left arm for all of her tennis shots, but she specifically says that she doesn't remember a particular injury, mechanism or trauma involving her shoulder. And she also doesn't feel that her symptoms coincided with a particular tennis match, a particular shot, something that went wrong during her tennis game. She's just said that her symptoms have been gradually getting worse over the course of the last month to the stage that they're now really, really sore and irritable for her. So in terms of additional symptoms, she denies any pins and needles or numbness in her left arm. She denies any shooting pain running down the arm towards her hands and fingers. She's just reporting this irritable severe pain on the lateral aspect of her left shoulder. Now she's had an x-ray on her shoulder within the last month, which thankfully has shown no bony abnormalities, nothing to be afraid of there. Now in terms of her medical history, she is a diabetic. She has been diagnosed with diagnosed with diabetes for some time, but she reports that her diabetes has recently been under control. As we said, social history, she's a really keen tennis player and is really disappointed that she hasn't been able to play recently. And as for work, she works in a desk-based job, which has been controllable up until now, but because of the fact that her pain has been getting worse, it has been troubling her. So next, let's move into the objective examination. So upon looking at her shoulder, it doesn't seem like there's any major swelling, bruising or anything like that. We look at active range of movement of a few different joints. First of all, we want to clear the neck. And thankfully, we see that this is pain free and not generating any of her symptoms. We can even perform tests like Sperling's test and palpation of the cervical spine, which don't aggravate her symptoms either. We look at her right shoulder active range of movement, which thankfully is pain free and is showing no restrictions at all. However, her left shoulder is clearly restricted in terms of range of movement. So actively, she presents with around 100 degrees of flexion, 100 degrees of abduction and only 15 degrees of external rotation. We then look to passive range of movement testing to see if there's any difference, but actually we're not able to gain any further active range of movement because it's really painful. And actually the other key thing from your passive range of movement testing is that you notice that her left shoulder feels stiff. When you get towards that end of range, it feels really solid and it doesn't feel like there's much, there's much give and elasticity in the end of her range. Now, naturally, we would want to look at some muscle tests as well, some resisted tests. But when we try to, we find that it's just too difficult. It's really sore for her to do these tests. And that's because of the fact that it's just so painful. So we can't really get any conclusive thoughts on the strength of her muscles or the ability for her to contract them without pain because it's just so painful. So, these are the key details we have for this patient at this stage. With that in mind, what do you think might be some of the potential diagnoses here? So everyone, with this in mind, let's go through the diagnosis for this patient. Now we're gonna start with differential diagnosis. There were three main alternative diagnoses that we had in mind that turned out not to be the case for the patient and were actually lower on our list of diagnoses. We're gonna go through them now. So the first one was osteoarthritis. The patient is around 52 years of age, so we might suspect that there could be some degenerative signs in her shoulder, particularly as she's presenting with a lot of stiffness. However, the fact that her symptoms have been worsening quite quickly and the fact that her shoulder x-ray has shown no bony abnormalities reduces the possibility of osteoarthritis in my mind. The second condition was a rotator cuff tear, particularly because of the fact that her resisted tests were so painful, it could be that there is a suspicion of a rotator cuff tear. 
However, the fact that her shoulder is really stiff moves me away from that diagnosis because with a rotator cuff tear, we don't suspect specific stiffness, particularly when her symptoms are only one month old. Perhaps if she, if she has been unable to move her shoulder in that way for a number of months, let's say 12 to 18 months, you could find that some capsular stiffness might set in. But with only one month, I wouldn't expect a shoulder to deteriorate that quickly in terms of stiffness if your patient had a rotator cuff tear. And the third potential diagnosis that was ruled out was a rotator cuff tendinopathy. Now, the idea behind this is that it was probably the closest diagnosis on our list to the actual diagnosis because of the fact that her symptoms have been gradually getting worse and also the fact that her resisted tests were just really painful. So there could be a thought process that this could be just a really irritable cuff tendinopathy and she's really struggling to activate those tendons. However, the other key symptom that we've talked about already is stiffness. And just like with a rotator cuff tear, we don't expect stiffness. The same goes for a rotator cuff tendinopathy. This is a muscle or tendon based condition. And I don't expect that patients with a rotator cuff tendinopathy should develop such significant stiffness in a short period of time with that being one month. So with those three ruled out, what did we rule in for this patient? So, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, the main diagnosis we had, which turned out to be the issue for this patient, was a frozen shoulder. Let's go through why. So, first of all, the patient's age is a real telltale sign here. This patient is 52 years old and the typical onset of presentation for frozen shoulder is between the ages of 40 and 60. In Japan, the translation of a frozen shoulder in Japanese is a 50 year old shoulder. And the reason for this is that the age and this condition go hand in hand. We do not expect 75 year olds to present with frozen shoulder. We don't expect 25 year olds to present with frozen shoulder. The condition and the age are so linked that around the age of 50 is a peak kind of time that we expect patients to potentially be experiencing frozen shoulder. The second factor is that this patient is a diabetic and diabetes brings an increased risk factor for the development of frozen shoulder. As we said in the differential diagnosis, we didn't think that this patient had a rotator cuff tear. And one of the other reasons behind this was that there was no particular trauma or mechanism of injury that seemed to bring on her symptoms. And for her age, we would expect that if she did have a rotator cuff tear, there should have been some kind of trauma that caused the tear in those tendons with such force. So instead, we're looking at a frozen shoulder. Now, the key symptom with frozen shoulder is stiffness, as you can see here on the page. When this patient presented, it was really clear that, as we said in the objective examination, the end of her range of movement felt really stiff. It felt really firm with not much elasticity there. Stiffness is a key sign within frozen shoulder, and it's a sign which differentiates amongst lots of other conditions, like we mentioned with a rotator cuff tear, a rotator cuff tendinopathy, for example. One other thing that we often look for with frozen shoulder is an equal restriction between active and passive range of movement. And that's certainly what this patient presented with because frozen shoulder is a joint or capsule based condition. So we expect that both the active and passive range of movement for her would be restricted as a result, which proved to be the case. And another telltale sign for frozen shoulder is when external rotation is so restricted. We know that the capsular pattern for the shoulder is lateral rotation, abduction, medial rotation, where external rotation or lateral rotation is the movement we expect to be most restricted. And in fact, when there is more than a 50% restriction in external rotation on the affected side compared to the unaffected side, it also increases our suspicion of a frozen shoulder. Now, the other major thing, which is a really important point for me, is that this patient has had an x-ray which has shown no bony abnormalities. And the reason for this is because there are other conditions, of course, at the shoulder that can present with stiffness as the hallmark feature, such as osteoarthritis or more sinister things such as avascular necrosis, a locked posterior dislocation or something significant like a cancerous tumour like an osteosarcoma. 
So whenever we have a patient who presents with significant stiffness, we always need to rule these out. And that's where the x-ray has come in to rule out those other things, which brings frozen shoulder more to the forefront in terms of our thought process. And that is all the key clinical reasoning as to why we thought this patient had a frozen shoulder. So everyone, I really hope you've enjoyed this case study. If you have, please support us by smashing that like button and subscribe to our channel for all our best updates. Remember, we've got loads of brilliant resources as well on our Instagram account, at Clinical Physio. And for more case studies, check out our website, member.clinicalphysio.com, link in the description below, because on membership, we have the Case Study Club, a brilliant feature where we bring in experts in different areas of physiotherapy to talk through their cases and explain the key clinical reasoning behind those case studies as well. My name's Khalid. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon here on Clinical Physio.